The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, who in the Paschal mystery established the covenant of re- new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Excuse me, I lost my page. From John chapter 20. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands and the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not believe, disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, you, Lord Lord Christ. Christ. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for giving us life, for waking us up, that we can be gathered together in your name. Lord, we ask that your peace would be with us. Lord, that we ask that you would come and be with us in new ways, ways that we can perceive. Help us to not disbelieve, but to believe. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you. Good morning once again. It's great to be here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> The Sunday after Easter is typically known as Low Sunday in in church speak. Congratulations, you're the brave ones, the ones who've made it out this morning. What a wonderful celebration we had last week, wasn't it? When else do, do we get to go and find candy hidden in plastic eggs, hidden all around the campus? We get to wake up early and do wonderful things as a family. We had a lot of family in town uh, for our Easter and baptism celebration, and it was really, really wonderful. And so last weekend, we embarked on a new season in the church year. We concluded Lent, had this wonderful time of Holy Week where we have services each and every day, and now is Easter. Easter, which lasts from Easter morning until the day of Pentecost. Easter where our readings will have to do with Jesus' resurrection appearances. Because Jesus rose from the grave once, but he is still risen. He didn't just appear one time. Even in today's reading, he comes two separate times, separated by eight days. 
This reading is, is packed with all sorts of wonderful things that we could talk about, but I want to focus a little bit on Christ's wounds, on his wounds. These were very significant, especially for one disciple in particular. Now, in our house, we are learning about wounds and learning about how things heal. Uh, Samuel got two bug bites a few weeks ago, and young children, you know, they heal very quickly. Uh, but these bug bites didn't, didn't heal very quickly. They're still kind of lingering on. Maybe it was because he was scratching at them because they're itchy. I, we're not really sure exactly why, but they are getting better. It's just taking a lot longer than we thought. We covered up his, his owies with bandages so that he wouldn't scratch them. He actually has a little bit of skin coming off his toe right now, and so we covered up with a Band-Aid each and every night. He likes the ones that have cartoon characters on them. These, these I think, are Yoda, Star Wars, uh, but he really likes the Cars Band-Aids with Toe Mater and Lightning McQueen. But with, with the bandages, his wounds started to heal a little bit faster. But in order for them to heal completely, we take the Band-Aid off so that it can dry out and just really, really get better. This is what we do, right? When we get hurt, we cover up with bandages. We take care with medical attention so that we can get better. But Jesus had wounds that didn't get better. Jesus had wounds that were special and different in some way. And I want to talk about why these wounds were so significant and what they meant, especially to Thomas. So Thomas says, I will not believe, I will actually, I'll never believe unless I see the marks in his hand, unless I put my hand in his side. Ooh, that's kind of, that's kind of gross, isn't it? I thought so when I first read that. It's not just seeing his side, but it's actually touching and experiencing the fact that Jesus has got this open wound that is not healed. Now, it's also not still killing him right? Because he's resurrected. He's not in the grave anymore. He is alive, and he can do things that, he, that we have never seen anyone else do before, such as walk through walls, such as appear behind locked doors. He says to his disciples a couple times here, he says, peace be with you, right? Why is he saying peace be with you? Probably because they're freaked out. <laughs> Whoa, our teacher, he was dead. We saw him crucified. He was laid in the gra grave, and here he is. Peace be with you. Don't fear. Peace be with you. Something new is happening. Something new is happening. So what did these wounds mean to Thomas? First of all, what are the wounds of Christ? What, what are the wounds of Christ? Where are they on his body? Oh, on his hands? Hands or, or maybe wrists? In his feet, where his feet were nailed to the cross, where the spear went into his side, also where the crown of thorns was laid on his head, you know, that was all marked up, and in his back, his back was scourged, he was whipped. I think, that, I think we got all of them. Are we forgetting any? No. So for Thomas in particular, these wounds identify who Jesus is. They show who he is. Who else walking around on the planet, has got holes in his wrists, holes in his feet, and a big spear wound in his side. No one. No one else. You can't survive that. You cannot survive that, even with the best of medical care. Jesus truly died. He really died, and he really rose from the grave. And these wounds are evidence of that. They show that this is Jesus in bodily form. He has a physical person. He's really there. He's not a ghost. He's not a hologram. This is not a vision. This is not some, you know, uh, drug hallucination that's induced by, you know, smoking things or taking drugs or that kind of thing. No, this is actually Jesus. They can touch him. They can see him. He is real. Now, these wounds are not only, don't only serve to identify who he is, but his wounds are very significant for those who follow Christ. In Isaiah chapter 53, 
one of the suffering servant songs that are found in the prophet Isaiah. Verse 5 says this. Let me know if this sounds familiar. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. And with his wounds we are healed. Another translation says, by his wounds we are healed. So these wounds don't just show who Jesus is. They also bring healing. Christ's wounds are the means by which you and I can be healed. If you think about an open wound, um, it's sort of an entry point into one's body, right? And we put on bandages because we don't want bad things to get in. We don't want to get infection. We don't want to get MRSA or C. diff or any of these other things that you know, can be really, really damaging. So we cover it up with a bandage. But Christ's wounds are not covered up. His wounds are open. And I think the reason his wounds stay open is because he receives into himself our sin, our iniquities, as Isaiah said, our unrighteousness, all the bad that we, that we choose to do, the rebellion where we rebel against God, Our God himself says, I will take that. And then what comes out of the wounds? But Christ's blood, right? His blood, his life, the blood of Christ comes out of himself. And it's available to the world. If these wounds were were healed up, if they were sealed off, the blood wouldn't be able to, to come out, right? His life wouldn't be poured out. But yet that's what Jesus does. He receives our sin and he gives us back life. He receives our rebellion. He gives us back forgiveness. He receives our death and our ugliness, our bitterness, our sin, and gives us new life, resurrection, renewal. Of course, it was at the Last Supper that Jesus tells us how we receive that blood. We receive it by taking communion, that his blood is found in the form of the wine at at our communion meal. We receive that blood, we receive that life into ourselves, and we're reborn. Reborn. Also, Jesus' wounds don't heal because they are timeless. In a sense, Yes, there was at one moment in time when when Christ was crucified, when he was laid in the tomb, and when he conquered death and rose again. We celebrate that on Easter morning. But Jesus continues to have those wounds because that forgiveness is continually available to you and to me. His resurrection is also continually available to you and to me. We serve and worship a risen Lord, and because he lives, as we were just singing, we can live and be renewed as well. Now, there's one other part of this reading that I thought was really, really significant that I don't want don't to skip. This man, Thomas, he doesn't really have a, a big part to play in much of the Gospels. Uh, this is his big moment, and he's given the label. Uh, does it, what, what is the label that Thomas is given? Doubting, Doubting Thomas, that's right. I like the ESV because it doesn't use the word doubt in it at all. I mean, I guess that's just the tradition that we, that we come up with. But it says that Thomas doesn't believe. Jesus wants him to change his disbelief into belief. Poor Thomas has this reputation as the doubter, but yet he doesn't continue to doubt, right? His, he does believe. He believes. He was not there when Jesus first appeared to the disciples. Judas also was not there, right? So there were 10 disciples gathered together, minus Thomas, minus Judas. Jesus comes. He shows himself to them. He breathes on them. They receive the Holy Spirit. He even gives them the commission to go into the world and forgive sins or withhold forgiveness to go and do his will in the world. So Jesus' work is done, right? He can go back to heaven. He can ascend and and be finished with his work. No, eight days later, Jesus comes back. Why does Jesus come back eight days later? Because somebody was missing. He wanted Thomas personally to know that he had come, that he had risen from the grave. 
And it's almost like he knows what Thomas is thinking, isn't it? He, kn- he wasn't there, but yet he says, hey, look, put your hand here and touch my wrists. Put your hand in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Jesus issues a personal invitation to Thomas. He relates to him not as one of his band of brothers, one of his group, but as a person, as an individual. Jesus comes to each one of us like that as well. He comes and he calls each one of us to exchange our disbelief for belief. He doesn't say, how dare you disbelieve? How dare you doubt the things that people have said about me? No. He just says, come. Come and see for yourself. Don't disbelieve any longer, but believe. Jesus comes to all of us and issues that invitation. And if you don't have personal faith in Christ, or if you've been wondering if this whole Jesus thing is real, maybe you're doubting the things that your grandmother and your parents taught you when you were young. Maybe you're doubting because of things that you've seen on TV, things you heard at college, things you've read. Well, doubting, disbelieving is fine. Jesus can can stand up to that. That's okay. But my invitation to you this morning, and Jesus' invitation, is to don't just take other people's word for it. Come and meet Jesus for yourself. Don't disbelieve any longer. See who he really is and put your trust in him. Jesus seeks Thomas out personally. There's a, there's a hymn that was written a long, long time ago that has endured and still remains here in our church. We don't sing it much here at this service, but I want to sing it this morning. Come thou fount of every blessing. The, the line in the middle of the song says that Jesus sought me when a stranger. Jesus sought me when a stranger. He seeks Thomas out, and he seeks out each and every one of us. So let's close this sermon by singing this song together. Would you please stand? Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we we offer you our hearts. We offer you our faith. Lord, show us yourself. Show us yourself to be real. Help us to see you as you truly are. Give us your peace, Lord. Lord, I pray for belief in the hearts of each and every doubter within the sound of my voice. Lord, come and make yourself real this morning. and Help us to live renewed refreshed, and resurrected lives. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.